Don't get caught in the mosh pit The fuel to the fire Ain't nobody can stop it it's Trouble in my city But you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip And I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits My click is indivisible I aim you duck I squeeze now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals Are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Yo we notorious We ain't no runners Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Yo we some warriors They ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my sweat, put on my pee, put on my mat, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my breath, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm running chains for the fame Never thought I would, and now I'm running You don't wanna follow me, now I'm the fucking fun What's going on? What's going on? Good evening and welcome to another broadcast of Steve the Kidney Nurse I am your host, Steve Belcher Hey, tonight we got a, I don't want to say it's a great show, but I think it's a great learning education show pertaining to ruptured dialysis access. Now, what made me want to do this show that I saw a kidney warrior on Facebook, their family member had posted that this individual was at rehab inside of a nursing home that apparently may may or may not have had a dialysis unit but <clears throat> excuse me the person was in rehab and the access started bleeding again with they they mentioned rupture okay now i wasn't there but apparently this patient had to be transported from the rehab facility to the hospital. Now, this is one of many cases that happen that happens to patients on dialysis. Okay. Now you may want to say, oh, how common is this? Okay. Before we go on, let me first welcome and thank you for attending the broadcast. I want to thank uh, my followers and, and crowd on TikTok as well. Um, but how common is this access rupture? I had one person on TikTok say that it wasn't true uh, about people dying. So according to the literature, okay, from the ASN Kidney News, uh, according to data reported, now this is only data reported. A lot of this is underreported, okay? But this is data reported to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that fatal rupture of arterial venous dialysis access accounts for close to zero point. 4% of all hemodialysis death, which translates into about one death per 1,000 hemodialysis patients per year, okay? Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it does happen, and I've witnessed this, okay? I didn't witness someone passing away, but I witnessed working where someone went home we, we made sure they stopped bleeding. They went home and the access ruptured while they were asleep and they passed away. Because if you sleep and if you have aneurysms, and we're going to get into what aneurysms are, those, those bumps, 
Now, if you have one that's real, real shiny, real shiny and bright, and, and you know, because some patients, it look like you just touch it or like just let go. And if you sleeping and you just happen to turn over the wrong way or whatever the case, if that rupture while you sleep, if you sleep, how would you know unless you felt the blood on your arm? Excuse me. So this is very serious. Now, a recent retrospective review of cases reported, excuse me, I tell you, this electronic technology, trying to keep up with it. Uh All right. Hey, this is live, not Memorex. So, um, as I was saying, a recent retrospective review of cases reported to the medical examiner in the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, suggested that there is a significant underreporting of such deaths. Uh, the incidence of non-fatal rupture is harder to estimate due to lack of data and no uniform definition of rupture. Okay, there's no uniform definition of what rupture is. Yes, I'm, I'm streaming on Facebook and YouTube as well, Steve the Kidney Nurse. So, is any type of AV arterial venous access more likely to rupture. The data says Gore-Tex grafts. Now that's the loop graft in your arm, which is a Gore-Tex graft that's man-made. And they implant it under your arm. Again, is any type of AV access, arterial venous access, more likely to rupture? Gore-Tex grafts are more likely to rupture than fistulae, probably owing to higher risk of infection and lack of uh, tunica media. Due to the higher prevalence of fistula in the recent years, However, it is likely that rupture of fistula as an absolute number may exceed the graph. Now, a lot of patients are getting fistulas. And let me put this up on YouTube and Facebook screen. I had a picture. Oh, I'm not going to waste any time with that. But we know, all right, if you have a fistula or even a graph, if you continue or if you stick at the same area, we call it one sightitis, sticking in the same area because you don't feel the pain like you do when you go to a new area. Because um, that's what we re recommend. Rotating, wherever you stick, you rotate the whole access. Don't just stay in one area. So what is the difference? Now, I'm going to get a little technical, and then I'm going to tell you what it refers to. What is the difference between an aneurysm and a pseudoaneurysm? Hey, Steve, what the hell are you talking about? Well, right here, well, you can't see it, but I have a picture up on TikTok. 
of a fistula. And if you see the knots on maybe someone's arm that's kind of bulging, we call that a fistula. But we call it, I'm sorry, that is a fistula, but the bulge is the aneurysm. And the way a lot of that happens when you're sticking in the same spot and you got that high velocity of blood going through there. And what it's doing is expanding. It's expanding and stretching the skin. And so this is an aneurysm. A true aneurysm is in the fistula where you see those bulges. Now, when you have a graft, which is the man-made material in your arm, and if you get infiltrated and the blood that goes outside the access and into your skin, into your tissues, Keep going, that could possibly cause what we call a pseudo aneurysm, which occurs in a graft. So it says aneurysms are a bulging in the vein wall that has been weakened by repeated needle insertion. Pseudo aneurysms are a result of leaking blood and have disrupted multiple layers in a graph. So you might say, okay, oh my God, what are the warning signs? What, what are the warning signs? Okay, hold on guys, let me interrupt this for a second. I'm definitely gonna get me a better stand. <laughs> We would do that. All right. So what are the warning signs of this possibly happening? So you won't become a victim of circumstances and you can avoid this. Because we got more than 700,000. That's right. 700,000 people undergoing some form a renal replacement therapy or point blank kidney dialysis therapy. And it's just about the majority of them have uh, access, which they also call lifeline, whether it's a graft, fistula, catheter, or even peritoneal. And you got you may have some uh, people watching right now that's on peritoneal dialysis and say, yeah, thank God. I don't have to go through that. I don't have to get stuck and worry about getting an aneurysm or getting a pseudo aneurysm or more or less having my access rupture because the fluid is going in my stomach. You see, this is why we talk about the importance of education before getting out of the hospital. Or if you know that you're going to be on dialysis prior to being admitted to the hospital, that you know what option is going to work best for you. But a lot of people don't know the option because they get, they get caught in the whirlwind of dialysis and they're not thinking about what's next. I wouldn't be thinking about what's next because I wouldn't know what's next. And so that's why I created my book, How to Survive Outpatient Hemodialysis. Uh, a, a guide for patient with kidney failure because it has all that information in the book. So again, you have patients like, yeah, people who are on PD. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't go in center because I don't want nobody sticking me. I, I don't I don't like needles. And that's okay. That's why they have different treatment options. 
but the majority of patients that start dialysis don't know about the different treatment options and they kind of get uh, uh, herded into outpatient. And some of the reasons for that, whether you want to believe it or not, is because these large companies, and then we're going to get back. I know I kind of went off the beaten path a little bit, but I'm trying to connect the dots for you on why you don't get this education to know about different treatment options because these companies are on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And we know when you're a Fortune 500 company or if you're on the New York Stock Exchange, what that means. And for a lot of people who don't know what that means, it means the shareholders got to get their money. Right? For instance, I, I'm a shareholder and Ford got a little little piece of money, not much, not much, Netflix. If I'm a shareholder in Netflix, I want to see people buying subscriptions so I know the shares per earnings going to, you know, it's the same in dialysis. You got people like Warren Buffett from from Hathaway Berkshire, one of the richest men in the world, is, is basically the majority stock owner. And you got other people investing. How do they get their money? Those machines have to be running. Because that's how the companies make their money. Running those machines. If those machines are not running, they're not getting paid. So, yes, they're providing a service. Absolutely. We need that service. But at, at whose expense? When you're just the number in the cogwheel. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's no education. That's why no one's doing what I'm doing, telling you about a ruptured access. So let's, I digress. So what are the warning signs? Because that's what you've been waiting for. So you don't fall victim of this. Possible signs of an impeding rupture include the following. Evidence of disruption of access wall. You saw you may have somebody got the bumps, you start seeing scabs at the access site that's not healing. Now I encourage you if, if you're watching this and you have an access that looks like this and, and you have maybe a scab and they're trying to avoid it and it looks like it's not healing, just like I told one patient the other week two patients sitting right next next to each other had the same thing scabs on the access need to put neosporum on that and avoid sticking that area but signs of infection persisting clot or scab Unhealthy skin, pseudoaneurysms that exceed twice the diameter of the graft or those that are increasing in size, and excessive access bleeding after dialysis. Around needles, you, you may be at the unit, someone stick you, and you on the machine, you may be watching television, doing whatever. Next day, you know, you see blood all around the tape. That's why we tell, listen, if you're watching this right now and you have an access 
your mom, your dad, your brother, and you go to Dallas, make sure, right, because this is what's happening now. When they put those needles in, they're using tape. They're just taping it down, even over the needle. they putting tape over it. Instead of putting a, a gauze over the needle site, they're just putting tape over it. And see, what a lot of people don't understand, that paper tape that they're putting on your arm, that be sitting on the counter. It could have fought, fall on the floor and they picked it up. It could be anywhere, right? And so they put that tape over the needle, which the needle goes into your bloodstream. You can't see the germs on the tape. You don't even know if someone dropped the tape on the floor because you didn't actually see them get it out the box. You just see them coming over with the tape, pulling it, taping it, and putting it on the side of the table tearing it and then where did he put it he ain't got no pockets on the lab coat you see him put it on top of the machine they put it on the counter they put it back over in the other stuff and that tape when they, when they put it over your site with no gauze over it they're putting you at risk for an infection, a bloodstream infection, or access infection. Like the, my man Cass say on, on TikTok, I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to tell you. When they just put the tape over your access and no gauze, right? This old school, we started doing it this way. So why stop? Why stop if we've been putting, folding up the gauze after we put the needles in and, and putting a piece of gauze over the needle site with tape, right? Like that, so you can't see it. It's coming out of a sterile packet. Now you're, you're more or less likely to get an infection, a bloodstream infection, because now you have a sterile gauze over that needle site. But if they're just putting the tape over it and no, and no gauze, you're at risk. All right. Now, also, if you're bleeding between treatments, that's a warning sign. Okay. Close to 60% of patients who died due to a ruptured access experience an excess complication event in the six months preceding death. Now, this is not no broadcast to try to scare patients with an access. This is, this is an education broadcast to let you know that it happens. And so you don't want to find yourself a victim of circumstances. For if there's no one telling you, how would you even know about a hemodialysis access rupture unless they told you at the clinic? And we know at the clinic, everybody's for themselves. You could go to the clinic, you see people rushing around trying to put this patient on trying to put that patient on and they get tired and next thing you know they go sit down in the corner and and get on the internet they tired ain't nobody feel like doing no education and i gotta be honest last night i worked i was mentally drained i knew i didn't have it in me to do be do education last night but I know how important this is, but also my health is important as well. Now, if I do dialysis and I get tired, and I've been doing it 39 years, what do you think the other people they put on for? You got some places 
it gives you four patients, five patients. Technicians tired. They don't feel like talking about no ruptured access. And so I'm not I'm not taking any, anything away from them. You may have some that do it, but the majority is not thinking about any education after they put on four, five, three patients. That's 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 mentally challenging, especially if you have or encounter a problem initiating treatment. So this is serious. This is the good, the bad, and the ugly of dialysis. I I didn't make this up. This was this was long going on before I was born. Meaning, you know, dialysis back in the sixties, and and they only had so many machines and. If you had kidney failure and you didn't have thirty thousand dollars and passed the medical board to God committee, you were going to die. And so, this unfortunately ruptured access do happen, and we want to make sure that you know how to prevent this from happening to you. And if you find yourself in this situation, what you need to do to save your life or your loved one's life. This is serious. As they say, this is grown up, this grown folks business. So what is the role of access physical examination and when it should be performed? A lot of patients don't know that when you go to dialysis and they're about to put the needle on your arm after they clean it, and you should be cleaning your access arm at the sink with that antimicrobial soap. Before you go sit down, you should be cleaning your arm with that antimicrobial soap they provide for you at the clinic. That's an extra layer of infection control and cleaning your arm. And then when you go sit to your chair, technically the technician or the nurse is supposed to do what's called look, listen, and feel. Assessment. They're supposed to look at your access. Look for any drainage any redness, any pus discharge. Then they're supposed to listen with the stethoscope. Listen to see if there's a brewing. Listening for high-pitched whistle sounds. Now let us know if you got a, a stenosis forming or a narrowing. And then we're supposed to feel, look, listen, and feel. Feel to see if we can feel a brewing. Do we feel any warmness or is it hot? That's an assessment. Look, listen, and feel. And if they're not doing that, you're getting a disservice. Okay? If you just got a technician, wipe your arm, boom, boom. But listen. What if wipe your arm and then they stick you, right? And then kind of find out you, your arm is clotted. Well, we if they would have did the look, listen, and feel before putting the needle in, they would have realized that your arm was clotted because we can hear the movement of the brewing through the arm with the stethoscope. And if we listen and we don't hear that brew it and we don't feel it, it's not working. Why would I stick a needle in your arm and it's not working? But if they don't do that, you got an extra, you got a needle stuck in your arm and then they find out when it should be the other way around. That's why they do the look, listen, and feel. So if you 
watching this and you go to dialysis and they're not doing the look, listen, and feel, you do it. And then when you get there, you make sure they do it. You're paying for it. Well, at least your insurance is you paying the twenty percent if you got a copay, or if you're using Medicare. But you can do this at home with your family member or for yourself. You can listen, buy yourself a cheap stethoscope at the drugstore, or go to a, a online or Amazon and put it in your ear and put it on the person's access. But clean that part with alcohol. Put on some gloves and you can check and listen for yourself and make sure yourself or your loved one, when they go to treatment, that the access is working. You're supposed to check it twice a day. So physical exam, when I say, what is the role of access physical examination and when should it be performed? Physical examination is best done before cannulating the access where tape and needles are not obstructing the view. One should look for the above signs. Nurses and patient care technicians should look for these signs at every session. Every session. The examination before dialysis should be done by the nephrologist periodically so you could be having kidney warriors watching this broadcast right now they go to dialysis and this is not even happening they just cleaning your arm boom boom putting the needles in start the treatment pull the needles out boom boom and you may not even be aware where they stick in you because you may not like needles so you turn your head and you put your arm out there, and they could be going the same spot. Boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, you got an aneurysm. Like, how did I get that? Because you wasn't watching where they were sticking you. You wasn't making sure they was rotating the access, rotating, sticking new spots. So when you go to dialysis, if they're not doing this, ask them, hey, are you supposed to do uh, what's called the look, listen, and feel on my arm? And they get smart with you. We ain't got time for that. Or something to try to make you feel bad. Don't feel bad because you're hearing it from a 39-year veteran telling you and reading from just literature. Because if they didn't do a look, listen, and feel, how will we know if your access is working or not? Now, now this is one of the great topic of this uh, article. What are the best preventive measures? What are the best preventive measures to prevent this or having a ruptured access? So primary prevention of rupture should concentrate. Now listen to this. Primary prevention of rupture should concentrate on avoiding erosion of the access wall. In addition to measures to prevent infections, cannulations or sticking techniques are extremely important to prevent the formation of thin wall areas, including aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. Rotating sites, including a rope, and I talked about this, including a rope ladder technique, make use of the whole length of the access and prevent wearing certain areas. But um, then they got something called buttonhole technique and fistula may have an advantage, but good data are lacking. Cluster sticking, 
the tendency to stick in one general area should be avoided. Lower risk of rupture is another reason why fish delay are performed over graft. Over anticoagulation should be avoided. And what they mean by over anticoagulation, meaning heparin, giving you a large amount of heparin, which is the blood thinner. Now, what is this saying? The preventive measures. One, rotate the needle sites, okay? Meaning don't, and you stick here Monday, Wednesday, you move up. Friday, you move up both needles, arterial and venous. And then the following week, you move up some more. And then that next week, you come back down and start where you began in the first place. That's rotating. It's not going the, the same area each time. That's what breaks down the access wall. And the buttonhole, all that is, is if you have a fistula, the technician, an experienced one, right, develops a track. In your arm, they use these buttonhole needles. They call blunt needles. They had this little stick on the end. You pull out, and, and what you do, you, you wet the area where the scab is, make it moist with saline on a piece of gauze. You put it on there and get that scab soft, and then you use that pick to come at the end of the needle to, to pick it off. Right? You don't use your hand. You got gloves and you use that little piece and pick it off. And then they put the blunt needles in that hole. Now that's different. Also, the rope ladder method, meaning if you look at a ladder, how you climb up a ladder, you got those ring, those rungs. Again, you see the first one when you step on the ladder, you just picture that on your arm. And each treatment, you move up. You know what I'm saying? But you got to be aware of this. You can't just go in and, and just give them your arm and turn your head and not seeing what they're doing. Because you'll miss it. Next thing you know, they'll be in the same area. Like now, I was trying to avoid that. Needles already in now. They're not going to pull a needle out and restick you when that's a good stick and have you hold that. That's too much. Also, use the whole length of the access. I be in units. I kid you not. I be in units, and I look at the patient's arm. And they got all this access, and they're going in the same area. And this, you can see it because it's worn out. And that top part, you feel it. And, like, you can go up there and be like, yeah, but, you know, I don't trust a lot of these people sticking. Okay, but somewhere or another, you got to use your whole access. You see it all the time. One area is worn out and they got all this other area to use, but they're afraid because maybe they experienced some issues with your arm sticking. But if you can stick down here, nine times out of 10, you can stick up there unless there's some issues going on. But you got to rotate the access. We cannot stress that enough. Um, how urgent is the need for referral when these warning signs occur? When you start seeing these warning signs, what I mean, like erosion of the access, uh, scab does not 
uh, healing, uh, uh, aneurysms that are not going down or they're starting to form. Start bleeding around the needles during treatment. You need to go and talk with the surgeon. Not the access center. You want to go back to the author, to the person that created the access. Why would if you had a surgeon that knows your arm and, and put the the access in? Why are you going to an access center that knows nothing about you over the person that created the access? So when you start seeing this, make sure you call, hey, doc, I need to come see you. You got this going on. The presence of one or more of the above warning signs. Just, just need one. One or more warning signs constitute an urgent and even at times emergent situation. Direct verbal communication between a nephrologist and surgeon is critical. It's critical. Not the nephrologist and the access center, because a lot of times these kidney doctors, they have state in the access center. That's why they send you to specific access center. They got stake in it. Everybody's trying to get a piece of the money. Active and recurrent bleeding and skin erosion require immediate surgical intervention. Again, active and recurrent bleeding and skin erosion. You know how it look like. Skin looks, it, it looks pink. Wearing away, shiny. You, you know the difference of your skin erosion. It's like, you almost look like, like an albano color. You know, you lose the pygmy or the skin around it, the coloration. You, you know. If you see that, you definitely need to go talk to your surgeon. And, and definitely stop having them stick you in that same area. Even you got to go get some numbing cream. We got a young lady named uh, Candace, my lady, on, on TikTok. Young mother of three. Doing dialysis at home. Sticks her own self. You be like, I, I, I can't do that. The needles hurt. Well, Candace uses, I believe, two or three, don't quote me, two or three different numbing creams to get a combination. She said she don't feel nothing. She don't feel nothing. And we all know the needle sizes, right? We know the, how the needles look. I don't need to pull them out. But for those of you who could be watching this and you could have a loved one on dialysis and never seen a needle in your life, you just drop them off. See you later. I'll be back to pick you up. You never probably seen a needle. And that's why these educations are important. So the whole family, kidney disease just doesn't, impact the person with the disease it impacts the whole family this is a family affair yeah the record it's a family affair it's a family affair and so 
This is the needle that I'm talking about. You got two of these three times a week. And Lord forbid. Lord, how they say it? Lord, Lord forbid. If you get a caregiver or a technician, and you, and you can ask the young lady on TikTok, I am Shay Shay. She did a video. How they couldn't get the needle in. And she's like, no, we're going to use my catheter today. I don't want any problems. So when you got, in some cases, people who are inexperienced and not taking the job serious, that's why I put that poll up. You go watch on my page. It's almost, it's almost catching up. I said it's 10 weeks. 10 weeks of dialysis training enough to be working with patients with kidney failure. 10 weeks. When you got some places that got colleges, two-year schooling, to get your, your associates in dialysis technology, but you got companies like David and Fresenius doing it in 10 weeks. So what's the difference? You go, you want somebody who's who been the training for a dialysis technician two years and got an associate's degree, or you want somebody 10 weeks? Who's gonna have the most education? I go, I ain't never heard of that, but they have program two-year dialysis technology. I'm like, damn, two years? And you got people going to the Vita 10 weeks. That's only two months and two weeks. And, and, and you think, a lot of people think, yes, that's enough training for someone with 10 weeks of dialysis to work on someone with, uh, with kidney failure, with their blood is going through the filter and all these other complications that could happen. Do you think they're going to be ready in 10 weeks if somebody's running and they forget, they, they leave the clamp on, they cut the machine on and the, and the pressure build up and, and the goddamn blood explodes all over the place? That's a rookie mistake. And who pays the price? The patient. You got somebody who don't know what they're doing, sticking the needle. And they push it all the way through. And next thing you know, ow, you, they cut the uh, machine on. They don't check and say, do you feel this? You know, make sure they're in the access. They just stick it in, cut the machine on turn it up to, to 400, next thing you know, you feel all this pressure. Like, oh, 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 and the technician don't know what to do. They're cutting the pump up and making it worse instead of cutting it off, clamping, and stopping the blood from going in to prevent the hematoma. So to me, all right, in this day and time, because I learned in three months, it wasn't 10 weeks for me back in the 80s. It was three months. And I couldn't stick nobody for six months. So nowadays, they come out of training. They're going to find who, who, let me stick them. Who going to let me see? Got a lot of people. No, you just stay back. You know, I'm not going to be no guinea pig today. So. This stuff you have to be totally aware of. And a lot of patients, when they start dialysis, they don't know. They don't know the person that, that's about to stick the needle or work with the catheter that they have maybe less than three months experience. They'd be like, wait a minute. What, what if I have a heart attack while I'm on the machine? Do you know what to do? Do you, do you know what to do if something happens to me on the machine? I'm like, I guess. You don't want to hear that. 
You want to hear somebody, yes, I know what to do. You don't want to hear somebody be unsure of themselves, I guess I know what to do. And you on the machine running and you say, what? You guess. So this is the needle that goes into the access or the lifeline. And what I was talking about earlier, you see how this needle is? It'll be in your skin and they put the tape right over that. Instead of putting the gauze that comes out of a uh, sterile packet, you put it over the needle and then put the tape on, you're more or less likely to get a bloodstream infection with no gauze over it. But they don't tell you that. You just sit there and think that's the way it's done. They put the tape on. You don't see no gauze until the end when they pour the needle out. And then next thing you know, you got a bloodstream infection. Like, how did I get that? What? I'm, I'm not saying that that's the reason, but you got, you can't rule it out if they're putting the needle in your arm and putting tape over your arm and they're grabbing the tape maybe off the counter or off the machine or wherever the case may be instead of out of the box. Because, again, you didn't see them take it out of the box, so you don't know where they got that tape from. Don't play yourself short with this. All right. What should the surgeon do when you go? Except in cases of infected or uncontrollable bleeding. You see, this happens. Except in cases of infected grafts or uncontrollable bleeding, the surgeon should try to preserve the access by repairing the high-risk area through, I don't even know this word, and your morphophy which is probably jump into access or create one right next to where you're having the problem. Not all access surgeons are familiar with this technique. In the case of graft pseudoaneurysms, endovascular repair with a stent is good alternative. How should access rupture be managed? Now, check this out, because you can be at home and it happens. Patients, members of their household. I told you, this kidney disease is a family affair. This, just don't think it's your loved one dealing with it. Okay? You're part of the equation as well. Patients, members of their household, and caretakers should be instructed on how to apply pressure if access bleeding occurs at home. They should call for immediate help, even if the bleeding stops. Immediate surgical consultation in a hospital setting is warranted. All dialysis providers should be familiar. It says all dialysis providers... They're talking about your clinic. Should be familiar with pressure techniques on the bleeding area and its arterial flow. So what is the outlook or what is the prognosis? Owing to lack of uniform definition and lack of data. It, actually, this is underreported. The prognosis is hard to determine. We don't know. Severe bleeding in the home setting is probably fatal in most circumstances. Not all. Most deaths from access rupture occur at patients' residence. 
And that takes me back to the story that I said in the beginning where I worked at a clinic and the patient went home and their access ruptured. I just saw that patient Friday. I mean, not this Friday, last Friday. I mean, not last Friday, but in the past. It was on the weekend. They come back Monday with Mr. So-and-so. We call the house. Family, oh, he passed away over the weekend. His access started bleeding. We don't want no deaths. If it if it could be avoided. So that's why I'm saying a lot of patients don't know because they stick at the same area. They don't know the long-term consequences. And maybe feeling good now because you're going the same area doesn't hurt. Over in, over in the UK, they serious about this. They say they so serious. They made a brochure for their patients called "Bleeding Dial Bleeding Dialysis Fistula or Graft: Information for Patients and uh, Caregivers." This this brochure will help you to take care of your fistula or graft. Recognize warning signs. Be ready to act when you have a bleed. Daily check. Feel for a thrill or a buzz. Tenderness. Heat. Look for changes in skin color. Swelling. Bleeding or weeping. Any other changes in appearance. And listen for a bruit or a whooshing sound. This is the reason why we came up with the help. This is the exact reason why we came up with the help, the home emergency lifeline kit. Okay? Comes with a pressure bandage. Because this is something, and it has an instruction card, lifeline card, care card. And this is, you just don't pull it out. You have a small, this is something that if you start bleeding at home, then you got this next to, in your dresser. And you you use it when it's needed. Got a tourniquet in it. I'm sorry, right here. Tourniquet, got the gloves, got short seal band-aids, and you got the four by four. And then you got the pressure bandage. Okay, again, this is used only in the emergency. And it's, if you got to access official or graph, right, you should have one of these in your house. Okay, I don't push these out there all the time, but in this show, this is time that needs to be talked about because if you have a health kit, and you got to grab for a fissure, at least you can rest the shore. You can rest the shore. If you start bleeding at home, you can pull open uh, your, your nightstand or wherever you got the help at. Hopefully it's close by. And pull out and put direct pressure on where it needs to be and call 911. You don't have to be scrambling around, getting a towel, trying to put a towel, and the towel getting soaked up, and you don't have the, the towel on that direct pressure. And if you're interested in one of these, go to my website, stevethekidneynurse.com, and go down, and you'll see the Home Emergency Lifeline Kit, also known as HELP. Now, Let's say this. If you're at home, okay, 
let me give you start from this be aware that's the first thing be aware because it is rare for a fistula graft to bleed excessively after dialysis but it does happen and can lead to rupture it's rare but it can happen and you just don't want to be the victim of circumstances in this situation the good news is because there's good news like man why are you always bringing out all this death and this and that this good news is that there are often warning signs and i talked about that if you know the warning signs then you're better prepared a lot of people don't even know the warning signs that's why I do these shows so you'll know the warning signs. Because you need to know the warning signs and be ready to respond if something should happen. Warning signs, as I mentioned before, you have a higher risk of excess bleeding if your fistula or graft is not healing is infected is bulging and noticeable increasing in size feels firmer than usual has very thin or shiny skin that's an indicator thin or shiny skin or if you have high venous pressure on dialysis that's why we say we, you should know your baseline pressure, your venous and your arterial pressures with the needle in at your regular blood flow rate. What do those pressures normally hang around that? That's why we do the education about the machine so you can know how to read the machine. It's not hard at all. Or also if you have longer bleeding time after dialysis if you start bleeding longer than normal where once it started it only took you five or ten minutes now it's taking you 20 25 minutes to stop bleeding that's something that's an indicator something's going on you may be starting to what we call stenosis starting to develop stenosis or a narrowing in the access where it starts to narrow right and now blood is making it harder for blood to flow through the access because it's starting to narrow. That's why you hear the whistle sound. That's why we're saying put the, uh, the, the, the stethoscope to listen. If you hear a high pitch whistle sound like a tea kettle, that means it starts some narrowing is going on. Again, as soon as you notice any of those warning signs that I talked about, not healing, if, uh, is not healing, is infected, like red pus, heat, uh, bulging and noticeable increasing in size, feels firmer than usual, has very thin or shiny skin, or you have a high venous pressure on the machine or longer clotting time after dialysis, for you to stop bleeding as soon as you notice any of these warning signs you need to notify the surgeon you can tell the staff but they're going to probably refer you to the access center you want to go to your surgeon Excuse me. You want to make sure you have two fingers on that site over the needle stick with a firm pressure. Apply firm, continuous pressure. Wait at least 10 minutes before checking to see any bleeding has stopped. This is when you're at dialysis and they pull the needle out. Okay. When bleeding stops, apply fresh gauze and tape or a clean pressure pad. That's why when I work with patients, they they like just leave. And I pull it in, or they hold it, put a piece of tape on it. They said, just leave that on. Don't take it all. That's why I put a new dressing on. 
I try to tell people this is what I do all the time. No, I don't do it. Okay, you don't want me to put a new dress in. Okay. But you should be telling them to put a new fresh gauze over your site instead of the old one. Again, you're paying for it. Why not? If bleeding restarts, commence holding your access again and get help. You got some patients to go to the scale. They start bleeding. They get to the scale. They start bleeding again. And, they, you know, they almost, I ain't going to say freak out, but they just kind of like a little shock. And say, I'm bleeding. And instead of, you know, you see that, don't panic. Just put your fingers over where you see the bleeding and come back to the chair. Don't worry about the blood on the floor. We'll get that up with bleach rag. Okay? You got some patients that get in the car and they drive home. And they start to bleed. They say, I, I feel something warm. And they make a U-turn. Right? And they head on back to the unit. Take their coat off. See all this blood. And then gelled up. Next thing you know, you pull all the tape off and see all this blood. And you pull it off and stop bleeding. That happens too. So... In this pamphlet that they have over the UK, they say, be prepared. That's at the end. Be prepared. Like, Steve, be prepared for what? You should have an emergency kit available. That's what we came up. I like, I thought about it then, looking it up. What? They talking about emergency kit? I, mean, I thought I was the only one that had that idea. Well, evidently not, because this is a continuous problem, not here in the United States, but all over the world. All over the world. And then some places like in East Africa, if this happened, you live in a village, and you about an hour, two hours away from the nearest hospital, now what? This, this doesn't apply to our, our kidney brothers, our kidney warriors, brothers and sisters in the United States. This is around the world. What do they do? It ain't like they got a hospital, a hop, skip, and a jump from their house. They can get on the bus or the, or the subway or call 911. So this broadcast is for those brothers and sisters that's dealing with it. And they find themselves at home dealing with this. If they can't get the kit from me because I'm over in the United States, at least they know what supplies to get and get it from the unit or the drugstore. That's four packets of, of gauze. And even if you're here in the United States and you don't want to get the kit from me already put together for you, build your own kit. Just like they talk about build a bear, you can build your own kit. Get some four by fours from the unit. Get some adhesive tape, pressure pads, and put them in a bag or something. Put them by your drawer. But but at least here, you got something. You got short seal. You got a tourniquet. You got gloves. You got the band that you got. Nice bag you can keep and just use the bag to restock. Get some gloves from the unit. Ask them for another tourniquet. Get some gauze. And go on, you I mean on uh what you call it, buy you some short seals. Again, if you're interested, we got them in red and blue. It also has my card in there if you want to. Getting in contact with Steve, the kidney nurse. Then I also have a card in there from Jen Benson from the Transplant Journey. If you need help trying to 
get on the list or navigate the process, Jen Benson can help you for free. She's a double transplant recipient, kidney pancreas. Who better to help you find a donor and get on the list who dedicates her time in helping people through the process comes with that card. So let's talk about an action plan right now. If you're watching this and you got a graft or a fistula, let's develop an action plan right now before I log off. I've been on here about an hour, 13 minutes. There, and it doesn't matter to be on for two hours. I mean, this is what I dedicate my life to. And like I tell the people on TikTok, you know, I had up to maybe 400 people, I guess, or two, I don't know. But not once have you heard anything about cash, uh, dollar sign, cash app. That's not what this is about. The information is free over here. You just got to be accepting and want the information. So again, let's talk about an action plan. So if your fistula or graft starts to bleed at home, at the store, or somewhere unexpected, there are some simple things you can do right now, okay? One, stay calm. Don't freak out. Stay calm. Ask for help from anyone nearby. Anyone. Three, you should be able to control the bleeding by putting pressure on the spot. That's what I was talking about with the help. You can take it with you. Hell, you can have it in your car. So after dialysis, if you find yourself a victim of bleeding, you know the help is in the glove compartment. And those of you who just got on, the HELC is available at my website. HELC stands for Home Emergency Lifeline Kit. And these are available at my website, stevethekidneynurse.com. Apply firm pressure to the area using gauze from your emergency kit if you have it with you. Again, don't be a victim of circumstances. Have an action plan. Be prepared. Start bleeding. Hold the spot for at least 10 minutes. And if the bleeding stops, apply fresh gauze and tape or a clean pressure pad. And if it if bleeding still exists, or if it's still bleeding, use your fingers to again apply pressure. Not one, but two to the bleeding spot and call for 911. Okay. Okay. This is serious. So I, we talked, I talked about access, how to care for your access, but this is different, ruptured access bleeding. So again, blood flow through your fistula or graft is under high pressure. 
because it's coming the heart is under high pressure as your artery and vein have been joined together it's been joined together the artery and the vein bleeding will not stop without proper and urgent treatment again i'm going over this one more time before i end what should you do if your fistula or graft starts bleeding shout for help again direct the pressure call 911 tell them you are bleeding from your dialysis fistula apply firm pressure over the exact bleeding site use gauze in two fingers or your thumb or a got down here a bottle top a bottle top they have again this is over in the uk don't use a towel or absorbing cloth as this will make it difficult to see where the fistula is bleeding from that's why i said don't use a towel a lot of people grab a towel and just put it over it and you may not have it over the site ask someone to press on your fistula scar to slow the bleeding so a lot of times people don't know this to slow the bleed you can put direct pressure down by the anastomosis lie down lift your fistula or graft limb up to a level higher than your heart ask someone to help if it's difficult for you to do make sure you are still pressing in the right place so you want to lay down or your chair hold your the access and put your arm up stay calm as i said before if the bleeding doesn't stop again apply even more pressure if the bleeding stops keep pressing on your uh fistula or graph until medical help arrives okay and with that being said this is the end of the broadcast on youtube and facebook i may hang around just a little bit on TikTok, but Again, if you have an accident, let me ask, look at these comments. I got four comments. What's up? Hey, Gerald, thank you, Gerald Thompson, checking in. I'm, I know who you are, Gerald, and I'm trying to get you on. I sent you a, uh, a, a messenger to see if what would be a good time to uh, share your story. Uh, Gerald Thompson is the guy from uh, TikTok that got blackballed from dialysis. Okay, he's doing dialysis at home. This man has an amazing story, amazing story of strength, um, uh, fortitude, and resilience. Sugar LaRoche. Oh, he said, good night. Uh, Sugar LaRoche says they don't do that in our country. Uh, what is that? She signed off at 841. See, whatever I must have said, Sugar LaRoche said they don't do that in our country. And this is what I'm talking about when it comes to education and putting the information or disseminating the information out there for warriors across the globe to be able to use this. So with that being said, going to close the broadcast on YouTube and tick, I mean, um, and Facebook. I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in this most needed topic, ruptured dialysis access. Please share this broadcast for other warriors who may not have gotten a chance to see this broadcast tonight. Whether they're asleep, doing something else, whatever the case, please share this broadcast. Knowledge is important. And especially this type of knowledge 
when it involves your life. So with that being said, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Excuse me. Let me just clear this. Thank you for watching. Stay blessed and encouraged. And please tune in for another education broadcast from Steve DeKinney. Oh, let me tell you, don't forget to tune in this Sunday, March the 26th. This Sunday, March the 26th, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA, 8 p.m. East Africa time. As another broadcast of our international show, Kidney Hub East Africa. And this week, the Kidney Ambassador Moses Kennedy and myself will be talking about how to know if you have kidney disease. Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, you, I'm sure if you walk around, you never heard of kidney disease, and, and you're seeing all these facilities pop up and people. Wouldn't you want to know if you were at risk or not? If so, tune in this Sunday, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA, 8 p.m. East Africa Time on Steve the Kidney Nurse Broadcast or the FIGO Initiative Facebook page. And then 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock that evening, I'm going to do another broadcast. I'm going to be interviewing a health research advocate for kidney disease. So... Stick around, tune in. We're just trying to get the information out there, make it entertaining. We're going to report the good, the bad, and the ugly of this disease so you can make an informal decision on whatever you need to do. You know everything from each perspective. With that being said, thank you guys for watching. Have a good night. Stay blessed and encouraged. And... Stay safe. Take care. God bless. Some brown don't get caught in the mosh pit The fuel to the fire, ain't nobody can stop it the Trouble in my city, but you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip and I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits, my click is indivisible I aim, you duck, I squeeze, now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals are fogging up my visual Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we notorious, we ain't no runners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Yo, we some warriors, they ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my strap, put on my beam, put on the map, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my rap, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm by the chains for the fame Never thought I would, and now I'm